There are many ways to study the scriptures. One way, as Come Follow Me invites us to follow, is sequentially reading. We read sequentially. And most of us study the scriptures that way. We just start with 1 Nephi chapter 1, we read 1 Nephi chapter 2, and we just read the books in order until we get Moroni chapter 10. We've studied it sequentially. And that's a wonderful and I think foundational way to study the scriptures. I think we need to begin with a sequential study. But there are other ways to study. May I suggest that studying it by theme or by topic is a powerful way to see the fullness of that topic rather than going through the scriptures and, and reading them as and reading the different doctrines as they appear a thematic approach pulls that doctrine from where they were written into one study so that i can focus on that doctrine and see what everyone in the book of mormon is saying about that doctrine that's a powerful way to study the book of mormon and both have their advantages. And so what I'd like to do is occasionally as we go sequentially through the Book of Mormon, allow me to throw in a topical theme, one that we've seen heavily in 2 Nephi, and we will see throughout the whole book. Allow me to focus on the main, one of the main themes of the Book of Mormon, and that is the atoning sacrifice of Christ. What did he really accomplish? What did Jesus do? I think most Christians know Jesus did something significant. They know he gave his life for us. And so they often point to the cross as that defining moment, that his crucifixion was the moment where he did something significant. The Book of Mormon has opened our eyes to help us understand exactly what he did. Furthermore, our non-Christian friends, often criticize Christianity by saying things like, why does God need help to save us? Why would an omnipotent God need a suffering servant? Why would there need to be a suffering servant? Isn't God capable of, of, of saving us all by himself? And once again, the Book of Mormon answers that question. The Book of Mormon answers why we need a suffering Messiah in order to be saved. So let's do that theme. Let's jump into that theme of themes. What does the Book of Mormon teach about the atonement of the Savior? What did it accomplish and why is it so significant in our daily lives? Let's first ask the question, why a suffering Messiah? Why does an omnipotent Father, an omnipotent God, need a suffering Son in order to save his children? Well, the answer as presented by the Book of Mormon is that our Heavenly Father obeys law and that law has a punishment affixed. Lehi taught us in 2 Nephi chapter 2 that wherefore the ends of the law which the Holy One hath given unto the inflicting of the punishment which is affixed now, if there's no punishment affixed, notice what he says, which punishment that is affixed is in opposition to that of the happiness which is affixed. Therefore, if there is no punishment affixed to the law, there can be no happiness granted because of the law. And Lehi clarifies that in verse 13. If you say that there is no law, which is what some people are claiming, that God doesn't have to follow the punishment of the law. There's not, there doesn't need to be a punishment affixed. There doesn't need to be a suffering Savior. Would suggest that we could just bypass the demands of the law. That God could somehow ignore that the law has a demand and a punishment affixed. But listen to what Lehi says if we claim that. If ye say there is no law, ye shall also say there is no sin. And if ye say there is no sin, ye shall say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness or happiness, there be no punishment or misery. Now, if these things are not, there is no God. 
And that is Lehi's explanation why we have a suffering servant. It's because our Heavenly Father obeys law. And law has a punishment affixed and a happiness affixed. And the only way you can enjoy the happiness is if you satisfy the demands of the law. So Lehi gave us what I believe is the greatest explanation as to what Jesus did and why he needed to do it. Earlier in chapter 2, 2 Nephi chapter 2, he declared, Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Now, what did he do? What did Jesus do? Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to. Now, I would suggest that that word to is so important to us. This is what he did. This is what he accomplished. He offered himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. That is what the atonement of Christ is going to accomplish. He will answer the ends of the law. Notice he repeats it. Unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Now that's what Jesus did. There is a punishment affixed to the law. And for us to enjoy the happiness that God wants to give us, the punishment has to be answered. And Jesus offered himself an offering to answer the ends of the law. Now, let's see if we can understand what that cost him. What does the Book of Mormon teach us that answering the ends of the law would cost him? First of all, I want to point out how many Book of Mormon prophets use the word infinite in in describing the atonement. That the atoning sacrifice of Jesus was infinite. Here are the verses that use that word infinite. Look how many there are. Prophet after prophet is going to say that the atonement has to be infinite. Now, let's see if we can combine that. If the ends of the law have to be answered, then they are infinite in their request. Jesus has to answer the ends of an infinite law. He has to go all the way to the ends of infinity. Now, that is so hard for mortal beings to comprehend, the concept of infinity. I have a son who, when he was young, was fascinated with numbers. He would count just for the sake of counting. He noticed that numbers had names. So one day he handed me a pad of paper and a pen and he said, Dad, write infinity. He wanted to see the number infinity. He knew what million was and billion. And if he had pushed it a little bit, he could have figured out trillion and quadrillion and quintillion and all the different names we have for large numbers. So he just thought infinity was the name of a large number. So he handed me a pad of paper and he wanted me to write the number infinity. Now, what if I had filled that entire pad of paper with digits as one single number? How close would that number be to getting infinity? Nothing. That number divided by infinity would round to zero. That number. In fact, if we could put all the supercomputers together on earth and have them come, you know, come up with the largest number they could compute, that number divided by infinity would be zero. It would be so small compared to the actual number infinity that it would just be dust on the scale and it wouldn't even com- com- compute. Jesus has to answer the ends of the law to an infinite level. So tell me how you and I answer the ends of the law. As I think about it, I think of there's two ways we answer the ends of the law. First of all, the law makes certain requests of us, and we have to answer those requests. So how did Jesus answer an infinite law? Every request, every request he obeyed. I remind you of this verse in the Book of Mormon, which might help fascinate you the accomplishment Jesus made. 
King Benjamin noted, I cannot tell you all the things whereby ye may commit sin, for they are diverse ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them. And yet, in every one of those, Jesus obeyed the law. He answered the ends of the law. And that is astounding to me. Now, there is a line in Lectures on Faith that astounds me in that regards. I don't know if I'm taking it out of context, but Lecture on Faith 5 says, But notwithstanding all this, he kept the law of God and remained without sin, showing thereby that it is in the power of man to keep the law and remain also without sin. I think that is suggesting that Jesus answered the ends of the law in terms of obedience as a mortal, not as the immortal being that he partly was because his father was an immortal God. He answered the ends of the law as a mortal, facing all of the challenges that you and I face as mortals, and yet he didn't give in to a single one of them. That is worth pausing and thinking about, that Jesus, in order to answer the other side of the law, which we're going to talk about, answered the ends of the law's requests. In all of those ways that King Benjamin couldn't number, he was perfectly obedient. He obeyed every command given to him by the Father and by the law. Now, that allows him to then answer the other side of the law. How else do you and I answer the law? We answer the law by doing what it asks. I answer its requests. But when I violate the law, I must answer to the law. If I get a speeding ticket, I have to answer for my ticket. I have to account for my violation of the law which means Jesus offered himself to, uh, to account for every single infinite violation of the law. He had to live completely obedient to the law, but be punished as if he broke every single aspect, infinite penalty for infinite violations. He has to answer every penalty that the law requests. Now, let me ask you, what does the law request? What does the law demand? Not today, but ultimately. What demand will Jesus pay that I couldn't pay? Sometimes we think of, well, when I sin, I feel guilty, and Jesus felt that amount of guilt. May I suggest that that is only a very, very small portion of the demand the law has on me for my sins? Here's the Book of Mormon's evidence. What will an unrepentant man have to pay? What do the demands of the law require of the unrepentant man? Well, let's first read from King Benjamin. In chapter 2 of Mosiah, King Benjamin gives us this great insight as to what the law demands. Therefore, if that man repent not, and remains and dieth an enemy to God, the demands of divine justice. There it is. That's what we're talking about. This is what the law requires that I pay if I don't repent. The demands of divine justice to awaken his immortal soul to a lively sense of his own guilt. Now, this is what Jesus is going to pay. But let's see if we can ask, what level of guilt? What is the guilt that one man will have to pay as a debt to justice for his undeeds, his unrepentant sins. What is one man's debt to justice? King Benjamin continues, which doth cause him to shrink from the presence of the Lord and doth fill his breast with guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever. In the next chapter, Mosiah chapter 3, verse 25, he continues that idea and says, If they be evil, they are consigned to an awful view of their own guilt and abominations, which doth cause them to shrink from the presence of the Lord into a state of misery 
and endless torment from which they can no more return. Therefore, they have drunk damnation to their own souls. That's the payment for one person's guilt. That's the debt one unrepentant sinner would have to justice. Now, Jesus is going to answer that. I will pay that eternal payment. But he's going to do it on what level? On an infinite level. He is going to take that level of guilt, that level of shrinking, that level of the awful view. He's going to take that to an infinite level. That is what justice demanded. That's the penalty that was affixed so that we could have happiness. And Jesus is going to pay an infinite guilt. Think about shrinking. Going back to Mosiah, think about shrinking from the presence of the Lord and being filled with this guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire. That's no level of guilt that I felt in this life. That's a penalty for a future day for those who won't repent. And that's a penalty that he paid. Infinite. He took that payment, that penalty, that demand of justice to an infinite level. Now, the beauty of the Book of Mormon is it gets, it tells us what he bought with that. What did Jesus buy? And I, I, I don't, I think we need to understand his pain, but not dwell on his pain as much as we understand what he purchased. I think one of my absolute favorite phrases of the Book of Mormon is a description of what he purchased by paying that infinite penalty. In Moroni chapter 7, as Mormon writes to his son Moroni about faith, hope, and charity, there is this incredibly beautiful verse. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased, because Christ hath ascended into heaven, and hath sat down on the right hand of God. Ready? Here's the point. To claim of the Father his rights of mercy that he hath upon the children of men. Boy, that is just beautiful language. It pains me that the world rejects the Book of Mormon and doesn't have that language because it tells me what Jesus accomplished by answering the end of the law. He claimed of the Father his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men. Now, finishing that verse off, notice the connection to Father Lehi. How does Mormon, who's writing to his son Moroni, have this connection if Joseph Smith wrote the book? There's no way Joseph Smith could have written this book. But notice the connection. Where did he get the claims of mercy? Verse 28, for he hath answered the ends of the law, and he claimeth all those who have faith in him. By answering the ends of the law, he claimed his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men. That's what Jesus did. He claimed his rights of mercy. Now, if we look at that as, again, infinite level, his atoning sacrifice was infinite. May I suggest infinite in breadth and infinite in depth. So, how many people can he claim? How many people can he offer mercy to? Are there limits to the number of people he can save with his mercy? There are no limits to the breadth of his mercy. How about depth? Is there any limit to the depth of the mercy he could offer? How far down into hell could Jesus reach to save a sinner? There are no limits. He could go all the way. In fact, he has. Let me just read some beautiful language from the Book of Mormon that describes how far down into hell Jesus can reach. I love how the anti Nephi Lehi's describe themselves. They said, 
they said in Alma chapter 24, verse 11, notice their description of themselves. And now behold, my brethren, since it has been all that we could do as we were the most lost of all mankind. Can his infinite mercy reach down even to the most lost of all mankind? He bought that right by answering the ends of the law. He claimed that infinite penalty. He paid that infinite penalty so that he could claim infinite rights of mercy and he could save the most lost. I love this description of Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni and Alma. It says that they were the very vilest of sinners. Can his mercy claim the very vilest of sinners? And the answer is a resounding yes. Do you see the doctrine that the Book of Mormon is teaching you about who this man is, what he has accomplished, and what he can now do in your life? If you follow the very simple requests he gives you, he claims your debt to justice. He answers your penalty to the law, and his claims of the rights of mercy are extended to you. Jesus has the rights of infinite mercy. I sometimes hear people say that they, after what they've done, Jesus can't save them. That is blasphemous to claim. There is no sin he cannot cleanse. There are no limits to his atoning sacrifice because there were no limits to the penalty he paid in claiming them. Now, turning back to the Book of Mormon, what is a second penalty that the law claims? If he has to answer the ends of the law for those who haven't answered the law, what else does the law claim we must do when we sin? Back to King Benjamin, Mosiah chapter 2 again, this time in verse 36, I think he suggests here another thing that the law claims. He says in verse 36, Now I say unto you, my brethren, that after ye have known and have had been taught these things, if you should transgress and go contrary to that which has been spoken, that ye do withdraw yourselves from the Spirit of the Lord, that it may have no place in you. There is what justice demands. It demands that you withdraw from him. Not that he necessarily withdraws from you. It demands that you withdraw from him. Justice demands the loss of his presence, the loss of him in your life. You withdraw yourself because of sin. You withdraw yourself from God. Now, if that's the penalty that Jesus has to take to an infinite level, Tell me what it cost him. Heavenly Father had to infinitely withdraw from him. He was infinitely alone and abandoned. Can you imagine an infinite darkness and an infinite abyss with no light in it whatsoever? What if you felt completely infinitely abandoned by God, a feeling that I don't think any of you and I have ever come close to feeling. And Jesus took that to an infinite level, infinitely abandoned by God. We suspect this is the moment he stood up on the nails in the, on the cross and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was alone in a way that you and I cannot comprehend. C.S. Lewis suggested he must have looked around upon a universe from which every trace of God had vanished. That was the penalty. That was what the law demanded. An infinite removal from God. Now again, what did he buy? According to the Book of Mormon, What did that payment allow him to claim? What right 
does he now claim by being infinitely cast out of God's presence? And may I suggest he has the right to rush back into our lives, even before justice would say he was cleared to do so. He bought the right, in the language of the Book of Mormon, to snatch us. He can snatch us. Now, that's a fascinating word used by two young men in the Book of Mormon, Alma and Ammon. Both of them say that they were snatched. Let's read Alma's version. Nevertheless, after waiting through much tribulation, repenting nigh unto death, the Lord in his mercy has seen fit to snatch me out of an everlasting burning. Notice he says it again in verse 29. My soul hath been redeemed from the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. I was in the darkest abyss, and now I behold the marvelous light of God. My soul was racked with eternal torment, but I am snatched and my soul is pained no more. He bought the ability to very quickly overcome that distance that justice demands that we withdraw from him. He bought the ability to snatch us and rush into our lives. Now, I know he doesn't completely overcome guilt. He lets me taste a little bit of it, so I repent. Guilt is required to get me to change my behavior, but the payment to guilt, I will never know if I do repent. And he lets me feel the loss of the Holy Ghost so that I repent. But that loss of the Holy Ghost is nothing to it, nothing like the payment he paid and I will pay if I never repent. So he claims the right to run back into my life. Now you be honest with yourself and you tell me, what got you in those moments of sin and transgression where you pulled yourself away from God? Was he completely absent from you in those moments? Or was he there beckoning you back, inviting you back, loving you back, and then finally when you repented, snatching you back? That's the right he bought to snatch us. Let's read Ammon's words. Ammon uses that same phrase. In Alma 26, verse 17, as he's glorying in the Lord, he says, Who could have supposed that our God would have been so merciful as to have snatched us from our awful, sinful, and polluted state? We didn't deserve it, he says. We hadn't fully paid the price, and yet he snatched us because of our repentance. We did enough to qualify for his repentance, and he snatched us from the full penalty of justice. And that's the right that he bought to snatch us. And he claims that right as he claims the rights of mercy. Now, let's do one more. Turning to the Book of Mormon. What did the atonement cost him? And I would suggest, as I read this, I might be off here, but as I read this, I don't find this one to be a requirement for sin. I don't think this was answering the ends of the law for sin, but I think this was his voluntary sacrifice so that he could know how to save us. But you, similar idea here, breadth and depth. Let's take a look at what Jesus, what did the atoning sacrifice cost him? In what might be one of the greatest gifts of the Book of Mormon in understanding who he is and what he did, we turn to Alma chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Ammon, Alma, Alma, who has left the judgment seat, is in Gideon, teaching apparently what is a very righteous branch of the church there. And he says to them, He shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations, of every kind. And there's the infinite. So putting that in next to the other two, tell me what Jesus took to an infinite level. Every physical pain. Every physical pain, every affliction, every part of the mortal condition, every physical pain. How many physical pains are there? How many variety of physical pains are there? And how many of them were suffered by the Savior? 
using the analogy of breaking my arm, how many possible ways are there to break my arm? How many possible breaks could I have in my arm? There's an infinite number of ways I could break my arm at different ages in different ways. And Jesus suffered every single one of those breaks. Now, here's the difference. I suffered it for maybe a couple of months while it fixed itself. Jesus suffered each one of those to an infinite depth. Infinite in variety and breadth, infinite in depth. He knows each one of those pains to an infinite level. He knows every affliction. Think of something that afflicts someone you love. Depression? How many varieties of depression has Jesus felt? And how depressed has he been? Addiction? Could we say that Jesus knows that addiction to every infinite level? Every human condition. Does he know what it's like to give birth to a baby? Does he know what it's like to yearn for a baby and not get pregnant? Every human condition to an infinite level. The next word was temptation. How tempted has he been? How many varieties of temptation and how deep were those temptations? And yet he never gave in or else he couldn't have answered the ends of the law the first way. The next word is sickness. Physical, mental, emotional. He knows every type of mental illness. Does Jesus know schizophrenia? Every possible mental illness and physical sickness. In verse 12, it talks about taking upon himself. How many ways, in essence, has Jesus died? How many ways has he died? He's been burned to death, suffocated. He died a slow death of cancer or COVID. He's been shot. Every possible way. He knows every possible way. And he suffered one, suffered that, not for just a brief moment like some of us do, but for an eternity. The last word used is infirmities. And I don't know exactly the difference between an affliction, a sickness, and infirmity, but I, I think we're just saying he knows every human condition. I love this quotation from Cheko Okazaki, who served in the General Relief Society president from 1990 to 1997. She wrote once, Jesus experienced the totality of mortal existence in Gethsemane. It is our faith that he experienced everything, absolutely everything. Sometimes we don't think through the implications of that belief. We talk in great generalities about the sins of all humankind, about the suffering of the entire human family, but we don't experience pain in generalities. We experience it individually. That means Jesus knows what it felt like when your mother died of cancer, how it was both for your mother and how it still is for you. He knows what it felt like to lose the student body election. He knows that moment when the brakes locked and the car started to skid. He experienced the slave ship sailing from Ghana towards Virginia. He experienced the gas chambers of Dukau. He experienced napalm in Vietnam. He knows about drug addiction and alcoholism. There is nothing you have experienced as a woman that he does not also know and recognize. On a profound level, he understands about pregnancy and giving birth. He knows about PMS and cramps and menopause. He understands about rape and fertility and abortion. He understands your mother pain when your five-year-old leaves for kindergarten, when a bully picks on your fifth grader, when your daughter calls to say that the new baby has Down syndrome. He knows your mother rage when a trusted babysitter sexually abuses your two-year-old, when someone gives your 13-year-old drugs and when someone seduces your 17-year-old. He knows the pain you live with when you come home to a quiet apartment where the only children who ever come are visitors. When you hear that your former husband and his new wife were sealed in the temple last week, when your 50th wedding anniversary rolls around and your husband has been dead for two years, he knows all that. He's been there. He's been lower than all of that. That's the price he paid in answering the ends of everything. 
answering the ends of pain and affliction and sorrow and death. He knows the infinite ends of all of that. He knows the human experience like no one else. Now, what did he buy? What did he buy with that penalty? Back to Alma's words in the city of Gideon, Gideon, Alma chapter 7. He answers the question when he says, That his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Now there's one. He knows how to comfort. He understands. And he knows how to comfort. My brother passed away when I was 16 and he was 12. A lot of people tried to comfort my mom. My mom told me, has told me many times over the years that several people have said things that were actually very hurtful and not comforting because they didn't know what to say in that situation. But who always knows what to say and what to do and when to do it and how to do it? Who knows how to comfort? Because he experienced the whole mortal experience. May I throw in another that Jacob is going to spend a great deal of time talking about, really Zenus, but we'll, we'll use Jacob's words. He knows how to save us. He knows exactly which of those mortal experiences are needed by me in order to be, to be saved. He knows what I need to experience. He knows every possibility and he knows me well enough and loves me deeply enough to handpick which earthly experience I need to have. Now, Jacob is going to quote the allegory of Zenos from the Old Testament. Let's just turn to Jacob's words, Jacob chapter 5. He's going to compare a tree, an olive tree, to all of us and each of us. Now, most of us read Jacob chapter 2 as all of us. This is a comparison of all of us, and they, they see the history of the house of Israel. But may I suggest that he compared the house of Israel to each of us. I will liken thee, O house of Israel, to a tame and a wild olive tree. Thee meaning me. I am like a tree. Now, if trees are left to themselves quite often, look at verse end of verse 3, they decay. Trees quite often decay. And so verse 4 is round 1. He comes in round 1 and he prunes and he digs and he nourishes. A little bit of snip snip here to prune and to dig and to nourish. And it was good, but it doesn't quite work. At the end of verse 6, the top begins to perish. The top thereof of the tree begins to perish. So now he knows he has to cut deeper in order to save this tree. And he's not going to give up. You go count how many times in Jacob 5 he says, I don't, it grieveth me to lose the trees of my vineyard. I know how to save them, he seems to be saying, and I'm going to do so. So what does he do? First and foremost, verse 7, he plucks. And I know all of you have been plucked. Plucking is the act of taking something in my life and yanking it out. Someone, an opportunity, something, someone and something that I cherished and I loved gets plucked out of my life. And it hurts. He plucked me. Number two, verse nine, he grafts in. Grafting in is the act of taking something I never thought I'd have to deal with, like cancer, and sticking it into my life. He grafts in things I have to now deal with that I never dreamed I'd have to deal with. Some things he plucks and some things he grafts in. And then sometimes, number three, verse 13, he places. He places in the nithermost part of the vineyard. Sometimes he takes us and we're just going beautifully in one direction and he just completely places us in another place. He completely changes our direction. I know so many of you have been plucked and grafted in and placed. Now here's the lesson. 
after all of this occurs, we let some time pass. Verse 15, a long time passed away, and we're going to go back to the tree that got plucked and grafted. And notice what the servant says. Verse 17, the tree in the which the, all, the wild olive branches had been grafted, it had sprung forth and began to bear fruit. Now listen to what the Lord of the vineyard says and hear him. The man who knows every human experience and knows you, knows which of those human experiences you need in order to be saved. And when he plucks and he grafts and he places, and it hurts us abominably, listen to what he said because it applies to you. Now, if we had not grafted in those branches, the tree thereof, would have perished. He knew how to save the tree. He knows how to save the tree. He knows which human experiences you need to have because he experienced them and he knows you. Do you see who he is and what he accomplished and what he gained? If, if he had not grafted and plucked, the tree thereof would have perished. Okay, so let's go find the tree that's in the nethermost part. Though that was so, I mean, he was moved to a place where he never dreamed he'd have to deal with. Well, they, verse 19, they go to the nethermost part. Verse 20, it had brought forth much fruit. I love this at the very end of 20. He says, this long time have I nourished it. He's been there the whole time. All that pain, all that plucking, all that placing, he's been there the whole time. The servant kind of chides him and says, How camest thou hither to the plant this tree or this branch of the tree? For behold, it is the poorest spot in all the land. Why, Lord? Why did you do it? Why did you pluck? Why did you graft? And why did you place? Why the cancer? Why the death? Why the loss of job? Why the a thousand things? Why, why can't she get pregnant? Why the miscarriage? Why the accident? May I suggest we could stop his answer at the, at for the first five words. Jacob 5, 22. Why the plucking? Why the grafting? Why the placing? Counsel me not. I knew. That's who he is. That's who Jesus is. And that's what he bought in Gethsemane. I know, he says, he's saying he knows every human pain infinitely, every variety, every depth. And he knows you and he loves you. And he's not going to lose you. And so he plucks and he grafts and he places. And if we were to question, he would say, counsel me not. I knew. That is the Jesus of the Book of Mormon. I love at the end of the allegory, he asks a piercing question. Verse 41, what could I have done more for my vineyard? And then he answers it. In verse 37, but what could I have done more for my vineyard? Have I slackened my hand? Have I not nourished it? Yea, I have nourished it, and I've digged about it, and I've pruned it, and I've dunged it, and I've stretched forth my, my hand. Almost all the day long, and the end drieth ne near, and it grieveth me that I should hew down the trees of my vineyard. So what's implied? What, what, could, what could I have done more? What's he saying? I couldn't have done anything more. May I suggest that that applies to your life. If some other life would have been better for you, he would have given it to you. If someone else's life would be a better way for you to be saved, he would have taken you on that path. He knows you well enough to know which path was your best shot. Your life is your best shot at salvation. Let him save you. Let him pay the penalty. Let him grant mercy. Let him snatch you. Come unto him and obey his gospel. Love him. Seek him. 
I love how Moroni ends in Ether chapter 12. I admonish you to seek this Jesus. Come find him. I leave you my testimony of him, of what he bought and what he is able to do with what he bought. May we all come unto him and be snatched. May we know his rights of mercy and enter into his rest is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.